Chapter Twelve of the History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. The History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume One, by Eliza Haywood. Chapter Twelve. Chapter Twelve is little more than a continuance of the former. Miss Betsy had no sooner disengaged herself from the encumbrance of a formal dress and put on one more light and easy, al fresco, as the Spaniards phrase it, than she began to give her brother's letter a more serious and attentive perusal than she had the opportunity of doing before. She was charmed and elated with the description Mr. Frances had told her, she had inspired in the breast of his friend she called to her mind the idea of those persons who were present at the entertainments he mentioned and easily recollected which was most likely to be the lover though she remembered not the name she very well now remembered there was one that seemed both times to regard her with glances which had somewhat peculiar in them and which then she had interpreted as the certain indications of feeling something in his heart of the nature her brother had described but not seeing him afterwards nor hearing any mention made of him at least that she took no notice of the imagination went out of her head this account of him however brought to her memory everything she had observed concerning him and was very well convinced she had seen nothing either in his person or deportment that was not perfectly agreeable yet notwithstanding all this and the high encomiums given of him by a brother who she knew would not deceive her she was a little vexed to find herself pressed by one so dear and so nearly related to her to think of him as a man she ever intended to marry she thought she could be pleased to have such a lover but could not bring herself to be content that he ever should be a husband she had too much good sense not to know it suited not with the condition of a wife to indulge herself in the gaieties she at present did which though innocent and as she thought becoming enough in the present state she now was might not be altogether pleasing to one who if he so thought proper had the power of restraining them in fine she looked upon a serious behaviour as unsuitable to one of her years and therefore resolved not to enter into a condition which demanded some share of it at least for a long time that is when she should be grown weary of the admiration flatteries and addresses of the men and no longer found any pleasure in seeing herself preferred before all the women of her acquaintance though it is certain that few young handsome ladies are without some share of the vanity here described yet it is to be hoped there are not many who are possessed of it in that immoderate degree miss betsy was it is however for the sake of those who are so that these pages are wrote to the end they may use their utmost endeavours to correct that error as they will find it so fatal to the happiness of one who had scarce any other blamable propensity in her whole composition this young lady was full of meditations on her new conquest and the manner in which she should receive the victim who was so shortly to prostrate himself at the shrine of her beauty when she heard somebody run hastily upstairs and go into lady mellicine's dressing-room which being as had been already taken notice of on a very remarkable occasion she stepped out of the chamber to see who was there and found mrs prinks very busy at a cabinet where her lady's jewels were always kept so mrs prinks said she is my lady come home no miss replied the other her ladyship is certainly the most compassionate best woman in the world her cousin is very bad indeed and she has sent me for a bottle of reviving drops which i am going back to carry with these words she shuffled something into her pocket and having locked the cabinet again went out of the room saying 
your servant miss betsy i cannot stay for life's at stake this put miss betsy in the greatest consternation imaginable she knew lady mellicin could have no drops in that cabinet unless they were contained in a phial of no larger circumference than a thimble the drawers of it being very shallow and made only to hold rings crocuits necklaces and such other flat trinkets she thought there was something very odd and extraordinary in the whole affair a strange woman coming in so abrupt a manner her refusing to give the letter to any one but lady mellicin herself her ladyship's confusion at the receipt of it her disguising herself and going out with prinks in that violent hurry the latter being sent home her taking something out of the casket and her going back again all these incidents i say when put together denoted something of a mystery not easily penetrated into miss betsy however was not of a disposition to think too much or too deeply on those things which the most nearly concerned herself much less on such as related entirely to other people and miss flora coming home soon after and relating what conversation had passed in the visits she had been making and the dresses the several ladies had on and such other trifling matters diverted the other from those serious reflections which might otherwise perhaps have lasted somewhat longer when miss flora was undressed they went down together into the parlour where they found mr goodman extremely uneasy that lady mellicin was not come home he had been told in what manner she went out and it now being grown dark he was frighted lest any ill accident should befall her as she had no man-servant nor any one with her but her woman whom he said he could not look on as a sufficient guard for a lady of quality against those insults which night and the libertinism of the age frequently produced this tender husband asked the young ladies a thousand questions concerning the possibility of guessing to whom and to what part of the town she was gone in order that he might go himself or send a servant to conduct her safely home but neither of them were able to inform him anything farther than what has been already related that she had been sent for to a sick relation who as it appeared to them had been very pressing to engage her ladyship to that charitable office mr goodman then began to endeavour to recollect the names and places of abode of all those he had ever heard her say were of her kindred for she had never suffered any of them to come to the house under pretence that some of them had not behaved well and that others being fallen to decay and poor might expect favours from her and that she would suffer nobody belonging to her to be burthensome to him he was notwithstanding about to send his men in search of his beloved lady though he knew not where to direct them to go when she and mrs prinks came home he received her with all the transports a man of his years could be capable of but gently chid her for the little care she had taken of herself and looking on her as mrs prinks was pulling off her hood bless me my dear said he what was your fancy for going out in such a dress my cousin replied she is in very wretched circumstances lives in a little mean lodging and besides owes money if i had gone anything like myself the people of the house might have expected great things from me i am very compassionate indeed to every one under misfortunes but will never squander mr goodman's money for their relief i know thou art all goodness said the old gentleman kissing her with the utmost tenderness but something continued he methinks might be spared leave it to me mr goodman answered she i know best they have not deserved it from me she then told a long story how kind she had been to this cousin and some others of her kindred in her first husband's time and gave some instances of the ill use they had made of her bounties all she said had so much the appearance of truth that even miss betsy who was far from having a high opinion of her sincerity believed it 
and thought no farther of what had passed she had indeed in a short time sufficient business of her own to take up all her mind mr goodman the very next day brought home a very agreeable young gentleman to dine with him who though he paid an extraordinary respect to lady mellison and treated her daughter with the utmost complaisance yet in the compliments he made to miss betsy there was something which seemed to tell her she had inspired him with a passion more tender than bare respect and more sincere than common complaisance she had very penetrating eyes this way and never made a conquest without knowing she did so she was not therefore wanting in all those little artifices she had but too much made her study in order to fix the impression she had given this stranger as indelible as possible this she had a very good opportunity for doing he stayed the whole afternoon drank tea with the ladies and left them not till a crowd of company coming in he thought good manners obliged him to retire miss betsy was filled with the most impatient curiosity to know the name and character of this person whom she had already set down in her mind as a new adorer she asked miss flora when they were going to bed as if it were a matter of indifference to her and merely for the sake of chat who that gentleman was who had dined with them and made so long a visit but the young lady had never seen him before and was as ignorant of everything concerning him as herself miss betsy however lost no part of her repose that night on this account as she doubted not but she should very soon be informed by himself of all she wished to know she was but just out of bed the next morning when a maid-servant came into the chamber and delivered a letter to her which she told her was brought by a porter who waited for an answer miss betsy's heart fluttered at the mention of a letter flattering herself it came from the person who at present engrossed her thoughts but on taking it from the maid found a woman's hand on the superscription and one perfectly known to her though that instant she could not reflect to whom it belonged she was a good deal surprised when on breaking the seal she found it came from miss forward with whom as well as the rest of the boarding-school ladies she had ceased all correspondence for many months the contents were these to miss betsy thoughtless dear miss betsy though since i had the pleasure of seeing or hearing from you so many accidents and odd turns of fortune have happened to me as might very well engross my whole attention yet i cannot be so far forgetful of our former friendship as to be in the same town with you without letting you know and desiring to see you were there a possibility of my waiting on you i certainly should have made you the first visit but alas at present there is not oh miss betsy i have strange things to tell you things fit only to be trusted to a person whose generosity and good nature i have experienced if therefore you are so good to come i must entreat you will bring no companion with you and also that you will allow me that favour the first leisure hour because i am in some hopes of returning to l e in a short time please to enquire for the house of one mrs nightshade in chick lane near smithfield where you will find her who in spite of time absence and a thousand perplexing circumstances is with the most tender regard my dear miss betsy your very sincere though unfortunate friend a forward p s be so good to let me know by a line whether i may flatter myself with the hopes of seeing you and at what time though miss betsy through the hurry of her own affairs had neglected writing to this young lady for a considerable time yet she was extremely pleased at hearing from her she could not imagine however what strange turns of fortune they were she mentioned in her letter and which she supposed had brought her to london equally impatient to satisfy her curiosity in this point as to see a person with whom she had contracted her first friendship she took pen and paper and immediately wrote this answer to miss forward dear miss forward the satisfaction of hearing you were so near me would be complete 
were it not allayed by the hints you give that some accidents not altogether pleasing had occasioned it i long to hear what has happened to you since last we saw each other and will not fail to wait on you this afternoon i know nothing of the part of the town you are in but suppose a hackney coach will be able to find its way i will detain your messenger no longer than to tell you that i am with the most perfect amity dear miss forward your very affectionate friend and humble servant e thoughtless miss flora had not been present when the maid delivered the letter to miss betsy but coming into the chamber just as she had finished and was sealing up the answer to it so said she have i catched you pray what new lover have you been writing to this morning it was in vain that miss betsy told her she never yet had seen the man she thought worthy of a letter from her on the score of love the other persisted in her asseverations and miss betsy to silence her raillery was obliged to show her some part of the letter she had received from miss forward it being near breakfast time they went down together into the parlour and as they were drinking their coffee well pretty lady said mr goodman to miss betsy with a smile how did you like the gentleman that dined here yesterday this question so much surprised her that she could not help blushing like him sir replied she i did not take any notice of him i remember a stranger was here and stayed a good while and that is all for i neither observed anything he said or did or thought on him since the agreeable confusion cried mr goodman gaily you are in at my mentioning him makes me believe you remarked him more than you are willing to acknowledge and i am very glad of it you do him but justice i assure you for he is very much in love with you lord sir said miss betsy blushing still more i cannot imagine what makes you talk so i don't suppose the man thinks of me any more than i do of him that may be rejoined he laughing outright lady mellicine then took up the word and told her husband he was very merry that morning ay said he the hurry of spirits i have put poor miss betsy in has made me so but i can assure you the thing is very serious but continued he you shall know the whole of it he then proceeded to inform them that the person he had been speaking of was the son of one who had formerly been a merchant but who having acquired a large fortune by his industry had for several years past left off business and lived mostly in the country that the young gentleman had seen miss betsy at st paul's rehearsal when they were all there to hear the music that the next day after he had come to him at a coffee-house which it was known he frequented and after asking many questions concerning miss betsy and hearing she was not engaged declared he was very much charmed with her and entreated his permission as being her guardian to make his addresses to her mr goodman remembered the affront he had received from alderman saving on a like occasion and was determined not to lay himself open to the same from mr staple for so he was called and plainly told the young lover that he would encourage nothing of that sort without the approbation of his father that after this he had a meeting with the old gentleman who being fully satisfied by him of miss betsy's family fortune and character had no objections to make against his son's inclinations having this sanction continued mr goodman and believing it may be a very proper match for both of you i brought him home with me to dinner yesterday and should be glad to know how far you think you can approve of the offer before i give him my consent to make it i have already told you sir replied miss betsy that i took but little notice of the gentleman or if i had should never have asked myself the question whether i could like him or not for as to marriage i do assure you sir it is a thing that has never yet entered into my head nay as to that returned he it is time enough indeed a good husband however can never come unseasonably i shall tell him he may visit you and leave you to answer the addresses according to the dictates of your heart 
miss betsy neither opposed nor gave consent to what her guardian said on this score but her not refusing seemed to him a sufficient grant so there passed nothing more except some little pleasantries usual on such subjects End of chapter 12